Hi everyone. Today on Front and Center, I want to talk to you about responsive imagery and why I think you should consider adding a dedicated image CDN to your hosting infrastructure. Responsive imagery is one of those topics in front-end web development that seems way more complicated than it should be. It's a sort of problem that confronts virtually every website out there. Every site has images, and yet the solutions always feel overcomplicated. Today I'm going to show a no-fuss approach to working with responsive images using an image CDN that gives us some big benefits for a small amount of work. First, it's probably worth considering the extent of the problem. The HTTP archive runs a benchmark of the most trafficked 1 million sites on the web twice every month, and image data always dominates. The most recent run puts images at almost two-thirds of the total bytes sent, and that total has recently tipped over 2.5 megabytes per page, on average. Depending on the sites you're building, you may have either more or less images than the average, but regardless of the design, there are some techniques you can employ that can make a big difference. The simple rule is this. Never send anything to a user that that user doesn't need. Not only is it wasting bytes for users that might be on unreliable connections, decoding image data happens on the main thread, making lower powered devices feel much more sluggish than is necessary. There are two ways to start fixing this. The first is to make changes to the site itself, from pushing back against an over-reliance on high resolution images in the design, to using vector image formats such as SVG that can scale to large sizes without a corresponding increase in file size. You can also integrate tools that can compress the size of your resulting files with no or little visual change. Finally, you can consider delaying the point at which some or most of the images are fetched by using JavaScript to only load an image once it's on screen. Today though, I'm going to be looking at what you can do on a per visitor basis. This is all separate and additional to anything you can change about the design or the implementation of the site itself, but really comes down to serving different images to different visitors. This can be driven by the pixel density of the user's device, the size that the image will be rendered given their viewport, as well as the browser they're running and the image formats that that supports. Taken together, it can turn out to make a pretty big difference to the weight of the images you send, on top of any work you do to need fewer or lighter images in the first place. But there's one thing we need to talk about before we move on, which is the humble image tag. Browsers have been expecting images to be referenced in this way since the beginning of the web, and they've made some optimizations. If a browser sees an image tag in a HTML response, it will immediately go and fetch it, without first waiting to see if it's visible, or even waiting for the rest of the HTML to download. This is a good heuristic because most of the time the image will be visible, and you should start fetching it as soon as possible. This is one of the reasons why it's so much better to serve real markup to a browser rather than a blank page and then rendering everything with JavaScript, even if your JavaScript bundle is quite small. That's a topic for another time, but it's something you should be aware of when considering approaches to responsive images that require JavaScript or CSS to be loaded first. When most people think about responsive imagery on the web, they think of the new additions to HTML that are designed to support it. They are the picture element and the source set attribute. They're good at what they do, but for a few reasons that I'll get into, I don't think they're quite enough on their own. Let's look at an example. We can use the source set attribute to instruct the browser that we have a higher resolution version of a particular image. If a browser on a Retina device sees this image tag, it will load the higher quality image. Otherwise, it'll use the one specified in the source tag. What's great about this is that if a browser doesn't support source set, it will simply ignore the attribute and load the original image like normal. No matter what, the browser will know exactly what image it's going to load as soon as it encounters the tag. What about something more complicated though, like if you have three different sizes of image? Well, when you reference each image in the source set, you need to instruct the browser as to how big those images will be if it fetches them. You do that by putting a pixel value after each image URL. Then you need to tell the browser how big the image will be rendered at. This indicates that the image will be rendered at 100% the width of the viewport. Again, this extra information is required by the fact that the image tag has to stand alone. The browser has to be able to decide which image to fetch based just off the information here. If the image will be rendered at different sizes depending on the viewport, you can add media queries to the sizes attribute. Here we're saying that above 600 pixels, the image is rendered at only 60% of the viewport. This is starting to get pretty complicated, because this kind of markup has to be duplicated for every image you want to serve in this way. And you need to make sure that it's kept in sync with the CSS that's actually rendering the image, otherwise the browser might be making the wrong decision. But if you think that markup is bad, it's about to get worse. Because the three universal image formats, JPEG, PNG, and GIF, aren't the only ones browsers support. Internet Explorer and Edge support a Microsoft format called JPEG XR, and Blink-based browsers like Chrome and Opera support WebP by Google. 
They both usually save at least 20% file size compared to JPEGs of the same quality, but I've seen photos that get reduced by half when converted to these formats. I think it's simply too good an optimization to pass up. If you try to specify all three formats in HTML, you need to use the picture element and three separate sources. A browser will evaluate each source tag, see if it supports the MIME type you've specified, and load the first one it matches. So make sure to put your better image formats first. The markup is quite complicated, but for me what's worse is the fact that I now have nine different image files to worry about. Every time I want to change this image, I need to make sure that all the files are updated at the same time. Most people think of an image CDN as just solving this particular problem. You upload a single master image to the CDN and tell it all the sizes and formats to generate. Which is useful, but to me it's nowhere near as useful as using the CDN in between your customers and your site. Here you've made the CDN an on-demand image processor, and it turns out to be tremendously powerful. You simply construct a URL with some metadata about the image you want and then the URL of the source, and the CDN will go and fetch the image, process it, cache it, and return it. There is a slight delay the first time an image is fetched, but in my experience that's well worth the trade-off for how much simpler it makes everything. Not all CDNs support this interface, but most do. Today I'm going to use Cloudinary for the demo because it's got quite a generous free tier, so it's a good one to get started with. I've also used Responsive.io in the past, and thought I should also mention Imgix, which is used by Unsplash.com, which is where I get all my test images. There are lots more out there, but these three all seem to be quite good. If we take our source set example from before, instead of having to generate each of these images, we can simply ask our image CDN for the sizes we want. So adding or changing one of the sizes is really simple, whereas before we would have had to reprocess every image on our site. If we look at our picture example from before, we can simplify things. We could ask the CDN to generate each of the formats we're interested in, but it turns out we don't even need to do that. Most providers support an automatic image format, where the CDN will determine the best format to send each browser, based on the user agent in the request. For Cloudinary, that format is called F-Auto. It means you don't have to worry about transcoding any images or complicating your markup. And while depending on user agent as a proxy for feature detection is usually a bad idea in your own code, that doesn't really apply here. The image CDN simply needs to invest the time in keeping their user agent list up to date, which, as part of their core offering, is a reasonable expectation. Back to the code though. I think this is a pretty decent compromise. The markup will still be immediately understood by the browser and the right image will be served every time but I don't need to maintain a library of different sized images and formats. Personally, I try to keep my sizes attribute as simple as possible, only using this technique for things like large banner images that are going to be visible immediately and fill the width of the screen. This is already a big improvement over managing these images yourself, but what about the cases where there's no way to know the exact size or even shape an image will be rendered without first loading the CSS? Well, we can't use source set or the picture element in that case, but we can still use an image CDN and a small amount of JavaScript to get a really effective result. Note that we're no longer able to take advantage of the browser's preloading optimization from here on, but let's look at a case where that trade-off is worth it. The first thing you need to do is set up an account, which takes only a few seconds. The thing I like about Cloudinary is that it works straight away. You get a decent amount of storage and bandwidth for free, and so it only takes a few minutes to give it a try. The one thing I would recommend you do before you start is restrict the domains that you'll fetch images from. Otherwise, people could use your account to manipulate images from anywhere, and you'd be paying the storage and transfer costs. There are some additional security measures like signed URLs, but this is usually good enough. OK, so let's look at our demo for today. We have an image grid with a bunch of divs with background images, all coming from Unsplash. These are the raw, full-resolution images, and so we're downloading 35 megabytes of data for just seven files. So let's fix that by resizing them all down to, say, 450 pixels wide. We do that by simply prefixing the URLs for each background image with the CDN fetch URL, followed by the resize instruction that you want. In this case, it's W450 to mean resize to 450 pixels wide. Notice that the URL also includes our username FEC Demo, so these requests will be attributed to our account. Now for those seven files, we're only sending 191 kilobytes of data, which is a pretty massive improvement. But let's throw a bunch more images in there. I've got another 45 or so here commented out, so let's restore them. For the record, I did try to show what 50 full resolution images would look like, but Chrome kept crashing. It turns out it's not designed to handle a quarter gigabyte of image data. Here we can see we've loaded 54 images in 1.8 megabytes, which gives us a better sense of the total weight of a page like this. 
This imagery is all from unsplash.com, which, if you haven't used it, is an awesome resource. The photography is excellent and covers a huge range of subjects, and it's entirely free. At 450 pixels, most of the images look pretty good, but let's be a bit more precise. If we widen the viewport, we can see that at different widths, the images draw at different sizes, which is going to cause us some trouble. For instance, this image is starting to show a few artifacts, because it's a 450 pixel JPEG drawn at 470 pixels wide on a retina screen. Because the layout is dynamic, we won't know ahead of time which images are going to be drawn at what size, so let's instead defer this decision to JavaScript, waiting for the CSS to be interpreted, then calculate the perfect image to load. So let's remove the inline style attribute and replace it with a data attribute that contains just the URL to our high resolution image. A couple of quick find and replaces and we should be okay. Here I have some JavaScript with a base URL to our CDN's fetch endpoint, and some code to loop over all the images on the page with that data attribute. This script is being included at the end of the page, so it'll only be executed after the HTML and CSS is already in place. Let's just make sure this is working. Great. What we want to do is look at the width of each image and determine the URL to fetch. Let's just confirm that we're seeing the sizes we expect. OK, so at this breakpoint we have two sizes, but if we make the page wider and refresh, we can see that we have three. Let's build up the URL and fetch the one that we want. The URL we want is a combination of three things. Our base URL, our image params, and our source image, which we can get from the images dataset. For now, let's just ask for an image of the same width as our image's client width. The last thing we need to do is just set the image's background image to a valid CSS string. Now we can see that we have our images back, but we've dropped quality a bit too far. Part of this is because we're on a retina screen, but it's also because we're not taking into account the aspect ratio of these images. And because we're using background size cover, we might only be seeing a small piece of the image itself. This is where we start to get into the much more powerful features of image CDNs. If we simply add a height parameter to the URL, we, we see distorted images. So we simply need to tell the CDN to crop the image preserving the aspect ratio, the same way that background size cover does. On Cloudinary, that parameter is called cfill, but all of them support this feature in some form or another. So now we have images that are pre-cropped to the exact size they're going to be displayed at, but sometimes the default cropping, which preserves the center of the image, means we end up with a less interesting image as a result. This is where using an image CDN really shines, because it's a dedicated piece of infrastructure that really understands images. So you can pass a parameter, in this case gauto, that tells the CDN that when it's cropping, keep the most interesting parts of the image in the frame. How it determines that, I have no idea, but it seems to work really well. Here you can see it's kept the buildings in Central Park instead of just the sky. So if you do start playing with these CDNs, do go through the documentation and see which more advanced features you might want to put in place. As we stand, we're fetching 54 images in 471 kilobytes, but these images are all JPEGs, so let's switch to WebP and see how much it saves. By setting the format property to auto, the CDN will detect that our resource is coming from a browser that supports WebP, and so it'll send us a WebP version of every image. Now the total size is only 354 kilobytes, that's 25% less than before, which is a pretty impressive saving for only typing a couple of characters. The final step is to detect whether we're on a retina device or not. We can do that with the device pixel ratio constant that current browsers will have defined, but for old ones we can safely assume 1.0. Then we just multiply the size of the images we're asking for. We can see we're back up to 1 megabyte for the page, but to be fair, that's 54 retina resolution images without a single byte wasted. We're using the best image format we can, we're pre-cropping all the images, keeping the most interesting parts in the frame, and we're doing it in such a way that every visitor is going to get the optimal response. There's a couple of things I wanted to mention just quickly though. The first is that we're only calculating these sizes on the initial load, and yet the images are changing size at different breakpoints. To me that's an acceptable trade-off in terms of the complexity of what we've written, considering that resizing your browser is something that web developers do all the time, but the general public less so. The other thing is that I'm locking the width of the grid at different viewports. If we made this fill the screen, then the images are going to smoothly fill the available space. That means that depending on the exact pixel dimensions of the viewport, each visitor might be asking for a very slightly different sized image. 
And because the CDN only generates the images on demand, you might have lots of visitors asking for images that the CDN hasn't generated yet. Also, you'll find that your provider sets limits to the number of distinct image operations you can perform on each tier. And so you might find that one errant page generates so many images you have to upgrade to a more expensive plan. So that's just something to be aware of. If you really want to keep the fluid design, I suggest rounding these pixel calculations to something like the nearest 100. Your users won't notice much of a difference, but you'll save yourself a bit of hassle on the server side. Like always, this example is available at this URL, so please check it out and let me know if you have any questions. That's all for today. If you'd like to watch more, there are another three episodes here on YouTube and seven more available to paid subscribers at frontend.center, covering topics from HTTP performance fundamentals, web font loading, to React component design. Basically, the whole spectrum of problems you may face working on the web. So head over there and subscribe. You'll get two new videos each month and you'll help make this channel possible. Otherwise, there'll be a new video here on YouTube in a month or two. Thanks for watching. See you next time on Frontend Center.